Got a really fun episode planned for you today. I have a coaching call with one of my 30 Steps to Better Jazz Playing course students. His name is Dan Sitch from London, Ontario, Canada. And we have a good time just talking together, going through some issues that he's having with his playing. I give him some things he can possibly practice. And this is going to be a really value-packed episode just for you to sit in on our very raw coaching call, just to really learn some things for yourself from this. I know you will. That's coming right up. Welcome to the LJS Podcast, where you get weekly jazz tips, interviews, stories, and advice for becoming a better jazz musician. And now your host, he's a jazz musician, author, and entrepreneur, Brent Bartstra. All right, what's up, everybody? Brent here from LearnJazzStandards.com, which is a blog, a podcast, videos, all geared towards helping you become a better jazz musician. Like I said, we have Dan Sitch on the show uh, for a little coaching call. It's a raw coaching call, really just uh, exactly like if you're having a private lesson. That's exactly what this episode is today. And I'm really appreciative to Dan for allowing uh, his private lesson, his coaching call, to be on the podcast today. You know, it takes some vulnerability. We do do some playing on this. I ask him to play some things. So I just want to thank Dan so much for being so open to this. And, uh, you know, I think this is a really valuable episode just because we get to really listen to Dan, you know, what things are working for him, what things he needs a little help with. I'm able to give some possible things to add to his practice routine, some examples to play through uh, that I think can really help him with where he's at mentally with his jazz playing game. And it's also great too, because Dan at the end of the show kind of shares some tips that has really helped him in his jazz journey. And it's definitely going to help you too. So you get the opportunity to sit in on this coaching call. I know you're going to learn a lot. Uh, I learned a lot just from talking to Dan and he learned a lot as well. All right. So without further ado, let's just jump right into this coaching call with Dan Sitch. All right, welcoming on the show is Dan Sitch from London, Ontario. He's a guitar player. He's also a student in my 30 Steps to Better jazz playing course. So, Dan, thanks so much for being here. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I think a great place to start would just be to introduce yourself to the audience a little bit. You know, what do you do for a living? Uh, You know, what what keeps you busy these days? Yeah, sure. Well, I am not a, a professional musician. I'm actually a librarian at a, a university here in London, Ontario. I'm in my mid-40s, a uh, guitar player, as you mentioned. Yeah. I've been taking music lessons since I was about three or four, I'm told. I started with uh, piano lessons, but even at that age, I think I wanted to play the guitar. Um, and I dabbled with trumpet and clarinet in, uh, in public school and picked up alto and then baritone sax in high school. Uh, so I would have played in our uh, our stage band in high school. But I didn't really learn how to improvise properly at the time. It wasn't something that they were teaching or teaching properly. Yeah. Um, and I, I finally picked up the guitar at the end of high school uh, around 1992. But I didn't start lessons for guitar until about 10 years later. So I was mostly just playing, you know, campfire yeah. type chords and that sort of thing. Well, I got interested in jazz um, partly because of the guitar lessons I started, but I think it was Chet Baker who really got me into jazz, just made it really accessible for me, right? Uh, Prior to listening to him, I I guess I understood that these tunes, these standards had melodies, but I didn't know what they were until I heard somebody sing them. So until I heard the lyrics, I didn't know that there was this definitive melodic line behind these standards. Uh, So... Hearing the song sung really uh, made the music a lot more accessible to me. And then I could sort of pick out bits of the melody in some of the solos I was hearing. Or I could hear the reinterpretation of those melodies. So, yeah, I, I blame. No, I give credit to, uh, to Chet Baker, really, for my enjoyment of jazz. That's awesome. I think that's really interesting that you say that, that the lyrics, hearing the lyrics. And I think that's, I think a lot of people that, you know, maybe come from outside of jazz at first, like that's something that really, uh, you know, not everybody is accustomed to instrumental music and uh, understanding when you hear, when you hear words as human beings, we just, we relate to words so much. And I do always suggest that when learning jazz standards, jazz repertoire uh, to listen to some vocal versions, if they are available, because they can be really enlightening, actually, not only to what the story of the song is, of course, but, you know, just to actually uh, put some, a different feeling to what the melody actually is. And then when you're actually playing the melody to that song on, on, well, in your case, you're a guitar player on your guitar, then you're able to express that differently. Would you say that that's, is that, that's true? 
I think so. Yeah, it definitely gives you a, a feel for um, the feeling that you should be portraying, conveying with, with the song. Uh, I was just going to say, I haven't looked into the lyrics of all the tunes that I've been learning, but I was uh, starting to figure out um, all the things you are a couple weeks back. And I, I kind of knew the melody, but I had no idea what the lyrics were. So yeah, it was very interesting and helpful. Awesome. And so what are some of, what are some of your goals for uh, playing jazz in general? Like what are some of the things that, you know, when you're when you're studying it and you obviously have signed up for my course and, you know, what what are some of the things that you have on your mind that you want to accomplish, you know, playing this music? Yeah, well, jazz in general, I just uh, once I started lessons and started learning um, about harmony, you know, more more complex than the campfire chords I'd been playing up until then. I just realized that I could make much more interesting sounding music if I was using, call it jazz harmony. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I could come up with more interesting melodies. So to me, it was, um, it it just enabled me to expand, uh, what I was doing on the guitar and more interesting to myself. Uh, and perhaps to some of the people who are listening to me play, I like, I like to think so. Um, (laughs) for the course, my goals were, uh, really, I'd been wanting to go out to a a live jam session Mm. for quite a while to actually participate. And so uh, one of my transformative goals for the course was to be able to go to a live jam session and to actually play there Mm -hmm. and not just to comp. I mean, of course they'll want you to comp because you're a guitar player, but uh, to, to take a solo from time to time and to really have fun with it. Right. Yeah. So, I, I wanted to to do it and try really hard not to get lost, not to get flustered, not to get too nervous. And I did get lost once or twice. There was one tune the first time I went out that I just I, I couldn't figure out the chords on the fly. Um, but for the others, I did a pretty okay job, and I, I don't feel terrible about the solos that that I played in the uh, first uh, three or four songs that I took. So, and and I did have a lot of fun. It was a great experience, and I've gone back. Uh, once since then. So it's a, a new monthly jam session that's set up at a, a brew pub in town. And um, yeah, it was a fantastic time. Awesome. Hey, that's amazing. So and you've you've essentially accomplished your, your, your transformation, your goal there by going out and playing at a jam. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it's sort of like the cherry on top, right? I mean, uh, above all else, I, I want to become a better player. So right. I, I want to learn some tunes, learn some licks learn some uh some jazz vocabulary yeah yeah i think you have the right attitude you know you're just you just want to play better you just want to you know it's all this stuff i mean at least for me it's about having fun with playing music right you know it's this you know there doesn't necessarily even have to be agenda that's the great thing about all this stuff and uh, i think that's amazing that you know you had the courage to go out there and go to a jam session and you know kind of get your get your feet wet a little bit and yeah sure you know maybe you learned some things along the way you got lost it happens to everybody um but man, yeah, I'm so I think glad it you helped out that. that it was at a uh, it was at a brew pub, so you know. That oh yeah, didn't really. Well, that, uh, that always helps. hurt my nerves much. Yeah, well, yeah. that's one good thing about you know all, most of these jazz gigs. There's usually uh, people are usually consuming some form of alcohol, so you know it. Uh, <laughs> that's right. You've got that forgiving audience. <laughs> You've as got well, a forgiving right? audience. Yeah, but but I've yeah. been playing. Uh, I've been playing in my on my own basically. You know, yeah. with or without like, seriously since uh, around 2000, 2002. and um, but it had always been just playing for myself. So really, I, I felt it was finally time to get out there and, and do something and, and share and, and to play with other people, which is a ton of fun. It's it's yes. a lot more fun than playing with band in the box or whatever you've got on yeah. the computer, right? Oh, 100%. 100% funner. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's I think that's what music is all about, especially jazz. It's really you know something that you should be sharing with other people. And that's really where it, it comes to life. The best moments that you can possibly have uh, playing this particular kind of music is definitely with other people. So glad you've uh, realized this. So this is very much so, jazz is very much so a hobby for you. You're a librarian. And when you, know, when you get home and you have some free time, um, you, you like to play your yeah. guitar. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah, it usually happens after the kids are uh, in bed and, uh, and and if I'm not totally wiped out for the, from the day. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's not every night I get to practice, but when I do, I try to put in at least a couple of hours. 
That's awesome. So cool. Well, awesome. I'm really glad you're in the course and stuff like that. And I've been seeing your your progress in the community discussion board and just, you know, I keep tabs on what everybody's doing and you're just someone who's stood out to me, just someone who's really actively engaged. So thanks for uh, for being that. Now, I'd love to just, you know, uh, it's a treat for me too, just to have, you know, someone in my course on to talk one-on-one and uh, it's going to be fun. I'm going to sure. be doing a little bit more of this. And uh, I think it would be great if like, do you have any questions that I can answer for you? Anything I can help with you with uh, at all that uh, you may maybe be on your mind? Maybe it's something in the course or outside that I can help you with? Yes. Um, I've got a couple questions. All right. Um, Fire the first, first one. First up is, is it's related to when I'm improvising. So one of the things you have us do in the course is to improv on the melody or sorry, on the tune using like a variety of techniques. Yeah. So I've, I've learned some, some licks. Uh, I've learned how to use chord tones, guide tones, yeah. and closures, and and how to reference the melody when I'm when I'm taking a solo, um, and that's usually my game plan when I when I sit down to take a solo. But <clears throat> despite you know this effort to stick to this plan, often I find myself meandering on the guitar, and it ends up feeling like my fingers are doing the playing yeah. rather than me playing what's in my head. And, and usually that's when I've just, I've lost track of where that lick is, or I've lost track of where those, uh, those chord tones are. And, and I'm trying to play what I hear, but I'm not always hearing, uh, uh I'm not always hearing something. It's yeah. sometimes the fingers that take over. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for, um, I, I don't know, just, uh, ensuring that I, I stick to the plan more, like, uh, find those chord tones, those enclosures, um, yeah. So, okay, That's great. Yeah, point. I can, I can definitely have some suggestions for sure. Um, something that comes to my head right away is, is kind of a question for you, which is, um, when you were, when you say that your fingers take over, do you mean that, so is it that you hear something, but in your head, but your fingers don't want to play it? Or is it that you it, just, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm not hearing anything, you're not hearing anything. and the fingers are, are doing just going through rote patterns, right? Okay. They're going through, through shapes that I've learned, but I'm not hearing it first. And, and inevitably I end up stumbling uh, upon a few bum notes and, uh, yeah, I feel, I feel that it's because I haven't thought it through or I haven't heard it through, uh, before letting my fingers, uh, try to do their thing. Yeah. Well, you, you know what the great thing about bum notes are is that you're pretty much only a half step away from making it a good note, right? <laughs> so like, you know, that's that, right. I've, I've had that thought a few times. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so that, that's something there, you know, I would say, so one thing to, to just to understand, I think a little bit about improvisation and, and this is just for me anyways, is that it's really a combination of a lot of different things, right? It's not simply, you know, I have the most brilliant melodies going on in my head at all times. And, um, you know, wow, if I could only just be able to translate all of that, right? I mean, there's other things happening, right? Like, for example, when you're at that jam uh, session in in, in uh, your hometown, you know, there's musicians playing certain things that you could never have imagined that they would play until they played it, right? And Absolutely. So, now, yep. that's not something that's coming an idea from your head. That's something that you're going to have to react to in a split second, right? So... You know, right. and also yeah. you're talking about, and this is a very guitar thing. So for those listening that aren't guitar players, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have something similar, but guitar players really do tend to latch onto certain patterns and stuff like that. That's the way the instrument is set up very much so. And, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I would say that's not a bad thing at all. You know, maybe yeah, that, that, that really isn't necessarily a bad thing. For me, improvisation comes down to you have this, this, you know, playing melodic ideas that are connecting with whoever you're playing with, uh, playing ideas that you truly hear in your head, playing things that you're familiar with playing, and then mm. playing things that literally you are hearing and you want to play. So it, when when you're saying you're going to some shapes and stuff like that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, something that I was hearing you say, though, is like sticking to the plan. Why do you feel... Yeah. So, what, what do you mean by that, sticking to the plan? So if I've, I've uh, made up my mind that I'm going to try to play arpeggios yeah you know arpeggios with a, a nice resolution so some voice leading between them yeah and then i just uh you know i get to a point where i'm like oh no you know i don't know what note's supposed to come next yeah um yeah because i, I want to have those nice transitions between the chords yeah and i want to be spelling out the chord changes 
Um, so yeah, to me, it's just a, a question of, um, if there's anything that I can try doing to, uh, increase my success at, you know, um, getting better at a specific technique, whether I, whether I want to apply a lick mm -hmm. to a tune consistently or guide tones or, or what. So I've thought of, you know, just slowing down the tune or, or, um, yeah, if you have any other suggestions, slowing down, definitely. Um, absolutely. Uh, slowing down things as slow as you need them to go. But l let's also talk really quickly, though, about kind of what some of these techniques are for. So just for those who uh, are listening that aren't familiar, I'll, I'll, I do cover kind of uh, in each module of the course, I cover certain uh, improv exercises that you can do. They're more theor like theory stuff, right? Where you can uh, conceptualize jazz language and stuff. So we talk about guide tones so that you know what those really strong chord tones are. Uh, and, and by playing those, what's the purpose of doing guide tones? It's so that you can start identifying what those are, right? If you can identify what those are, that's a great starting point. And then we talk about playing chord tones. So, you know, that's connecting even more of those dots in there. Uh, we talk about doing enclosures, which is really kind of a way to conceptualize bebop language, right? So when we do all of this stuff mm -hmm. um and when we do the licks even when you learn the solos and stuff like that it's not that you want to be sticking to the, that them as a plan or as a, as a rule we do these things more as um you know kind of like the reason that you do the scales and we also do patterns right in in the course you do right, these yeah. things so that maybe certain movements or certain ideas might come to your head or maybe they'll feel familiar to you you know that's it, it's like learning any language right if you first you learn a word mm -hmm. then you learn a sentence and something someone says something back to you and you have no clue what they're saying but then you learn something a little bit more and you're like oh now i know how to respond to that you know it's it's exactly the same thing Sure, but like as with language, uh, I hear what you're saying. If you learn a new word, you're not going to go out the next day and try to use that word in every single sentence. That's correct, right? Yes. So, yeah, yeah. So maybe something similar is uh, is true for for jazz improv. So that that's the hard thing about improv in general is that you're really not supposed to be thinking about anything, right? Like that's where true improv happens. And if you listen to someone like Keith Jarrett, for example, when you're listening, it's it's almost like he, he's like one of the best examples of of someone who really is a true improviser. You know, you don't really hear a lot of licks or regurgitated things. Um, that's like a, the like the ultimate level, I would say, is is to get to that. So maybe at the end of the day, we don't really want to be thinking about licks, but we work on all that stuff. Because it helps us get all of them are building blocks, right? And I really set up the course that way. There are different building blocks, different essential elements that if we're really working on those things all the time, it's just going to keep building up our skills and making all that language more familiar. So here's something. Here, here's some things that maybe I would suggest. Have you? Let's start with one thing that has nothing to do with chord changes. Have you ever tried playing free before? And when I say free, I just mean like making up melodies. That doesn't mean avant garde, although it could be. Um, have any of you tried that before? Yeah, I, you know, I've I've tried it once or twice. I've heard the suggestion, and I, I guess uh, where I would fit that into the practice routine is is maybe at the start before I uh, even hit go on the backing yeah. track, right? I, I don't do that as much as maybe I should, um, just because I have this uh, slight aversion to, uh, to to free jazz. I uh, I don't quite understand it at this point. So Yeah, don't think of it as free jazz. I mean, the word free is a term. Let's not connect it to a style necessarily. The idea of it is, is you're just playing melodies that you're coming up with in your head. So the exercise of it is really you're trying to just hear ideas and not judge them at all and just play them. Like that's, for me, that's the first level. And then we're going to do something else that you can try too. Um, but how about let's do this? Like I'm going to play something like free a little bit, just whatever I want. And then how about you play something after I'm done? Is that cool? All right. Yeah. <laughs> Putting you on the spot, but it's okay. Get it's ready a, for a disaster, folks. No, it, yeah. see, it's judgment free. Whatever you play, it doesn't matter. It's gonna, it's, it's sure. good because it's what you're coming up with in your head, right? It's sort of like, you know, practicing, let's say like if you're like a therapist or like a psychologist, you would say like if you want someone to change their mindset, you have to continually, you know, train your brain to think a certain way. Well, it's the same thing that we're doing here, right? Uh, try gotcha. playing free a little bit. All right. So let, let me, let me try playing.
Your turn, Dan. <laughs> all right, all right. The pressure's on. Awesome. Great. All right. Yeah. Stick a fork in me. I'm finished. No, it was good. So great. It was awesome. So something that I would say to try on your own another time when you play free is try to play a, a quote unquote wrong note that goes against the tonality you're playing in. And sure. See yeah. Because you... I was trying very hard to play all, all right notes there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I'm putting you, you on the spot. Yeah. You know, I'm putting you on the spot here. But yeah. no, it was good. Everything you're doing is good because there's no right or wrong answers. But that would be something maybe to try. Try playing something that's, you know, purposefully a wrong note and see if you can just start creating something else from there. You know? Sure. Because I, I really felt like I was trying quite hard to stick to the to the tonality there that was in my head so yeah right great idea. right 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 so so that's the crazy thing about improv right is that things never go right <laughs> at least for yeah. me so yeah. um i think it's great just to practice that freedom there of just allowing yourself to play just about anything and even if it lands on a note that you're like oh that's not really what i was trying to go for well let me just try playing off of that right is a judgment-free zone for yourself where there's no expectations you're just going to try to create melodies right because that's what improv is it's just trying to create melodies um mm. so now that we so we've done that so that's something that i think would be great for you to maybe add a little bit is try cool. spending like five or ten minutes of just trying to do that again not not avant-garde not free jazz just playing whatever comes to mind that is melodic you know because we want to build that uh we want to build that sense of, of freedom and that ability just to have our ears latch on to ideas um mm -hmm. let's try something a little bit further if, if you don't mind and again i'm putting you on the spot but this yep. is this is this is going to be a safe a safe one i think um can we do a two five one chord progression in g major is that cool sure yeah okay great so obviously that's a, a minor seven, D seven, G major seven. So here's something that we can start doing. Like, and this is totally the opposite of trying to remember the licks that you've learned. Okay, this is this is a totally different thing. And this is something where you know the practice room. It's like the laboratory. We don't have to worry about playing everything perfect. Uh, we don't have to worry about playing things up to speed. We can be have it slow down as much as possible. You you, you mentioned that as a solution earlier to mm -hmm. some of the stuff is just slowing things down. Absolutely. So what I want to do. I want to try an exercise where we're going to play a two, five, one, and we're going to play only quarter notes with our improvising. And okay. so basically you're only have, you're only going to play four notes per chord. Does that make sense? So four gotcha. notes on yep. a minor seven, four notes on D seven and four notes on G major seven. So for example, I might do something like this. Okay. Or, Maybe I'll try. So, I, so I'm basically I'm I'm picking different notes that I want to start on. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's start on the ninth. So, okay, and then maybe mm -hmm. I'll start on. Uh, well, let's just even start on the root. Okay, anything goes, right? Just try to hit four notes. So, you want to give that a try? Just see what you come up with there. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, what tempo? Any tempo. Just 
whatever as slow as you want, you know, even maybe let yourself think about the note choices a little bit, you know, like, okay. oh, we're about to hit the downbeat on the D7. What note do I want to hit to make sure it sounds like the D7 is coming out? Gotcha. By the way, do you know the answer to that? What would be a good note choice? Sorry, what was the question again? So I, if, I was thinking you were, word fingering here for a second. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. So yeah. if you're going to land on beat one of the D7, what would be like a good chord tone to land on? Oh, uh, the F sharp. Yeah, so you said absolutely. On, on D7, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, right? The third. So that would be a good <laughs> choice. You don't have to, right? But let's just experiment. Allow, may, allow yourself to experiment. Maybe you land on the flat nine. I don't care. So yeah, g- give it a try. See, see what you come up with. Try one of them. Okay, and so are you comping in the background or am I just playing this? No, it's, in the uh, on Skype it will just be a mess. Yeah, just play oh, it yeah. by yourself. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. So just a, like a bar of each, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Just just quarter notes. Try try another one. Try starting on a different note. Okay. Awesome. Hey, I actually really heard the chord changes come out with that one. I mean, you hit it sounded like you hit a dominant 7th rather than a major 7th on on the one chord there. But that that you know yeah, what I mean, but that's You're right. I did. <laughs> but you know, that that that's a beautiful thing about what we're doing right now like that that's okay. We're taking things slow. We're trying different ideas. Uh, try another one. Try another one. Sure. Yeah, let's Great. give that another shot. Yeah, go go for it. Yeah. You know, how about you also add this in a little bit to your practice routines? Spend some time and just pick a 251 in any any chord per, any any key, doesn't matter what key. And just do this quarter note exercise. Don't even worry about eighth notes yet or anything like that. Just try experimenting with different ways to play things. I guarantee you're going to do this enough time that you're going to be like, for example, I think I think something that I played for my example was and I didn't really mean to play that, but that's just what came out. And honestly, I, now that I'm real, I, I do that all the time, you know, in some shape or fashion over a two five one chord progression. Um, it's just something that I've, you know, it th- that outlines the chord so well. And you know, so I think I'm starting on the third there. That's the third. Uh, that's the third of the D seven. And then there's that flat nine of the D seven. And then I land on the fifth of G major seven. So it's just something that I'm hearing in my head and it's just coming to be, right? And I think the yeah. more that you try those sort those sort of things for yourself, they're going to come together. And you can also think about some of the licks that you're learning or maybe a part of, this, of this, the solo that you're learning. Are you, are you learning the Miles Davis solo? What solo are you learning? In yeah, the right now I'm at the, uh, the tail end of um, his solo on Autumn Leaves. Oh, sweet. Okay. Right. You know, so you might hear something. I mean, he plays very melodically, right? He's not necessarily playing bebop or, or, you know, over changes and stuff like that. But um, you might hear something that Miles Davis played. And you'll think about that when you're doing this, these kind of like experiments with your with your playing over two five ones. Um, So so, you know, you're doing this free exercise because it's just helping you go, okay, we don't have any chord changes. We don't have any stipulations. Nothing's holding us back here. It's okay, whatever I want to play. And then also, you know, like I said, maybe challenge yourself a little bit. And, you know, when you're playing free, maybe hit a note that doesn't make any sense to what you're playing. Right. And then yep. try to see what you can do there. Maybe, you know, that, that's going to be the real challenge of creating melodies on the fly, right? And again, we were also on top of that, you were saying, you know, sometimes I hit a bum note at the jam session. Doing that might help you correct those bum notes quick because your ear will go, oh, fix it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then, so then you, and then you add these stipulations on it, like, okay, two, five, one chord progression in the key of G in this case. All right. Let's just try to see how many ideas I can come up with using just quarter notes. That's going to make those chord changes come out. All right. 
So the point of all this Sounds is it's, yeah. it, it's sort of, you know, almost anti what you were asking me <laughs> to yeah, do. Yeah, but that's, no, but, I, but that's I because I that, actually yeah. think that maybe what you need is this instead. Maybe that's what you need is more. You're talking about you want to play what you hear. This is really a great way to do it. You're taking all this information like enclosures and guide tones and chord tones and solos and all that other stuff. And then you're going, okay, now what am I going to do with it? Because that's ultimately mm-hmm. what matters. You're not going to be at a jam session and all of a sudden you're going to be like, oh, play lick number two from the exercise yeah, right, book right. of 30 <laughs> Steps Better Jazz. You know, you're not going to do that, right? You're going to want, I mean, maybe you'll play something like that but hopefully it'll come like organically and you might not even play it verbatim. You might play it slightly differently or you might gotcha. have yeah. practiced this exercise that we're doing so many times that you end up coming up with some of your own ideas, but you're like, oh, hey, actually I originally got that idea to land on the third and then the flat nine going into the five of G major seven from one of the licks I learned from Sonny Rollins or something like that. You know, you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea of it happening organically, yeah, makes a lot yes. of sense. Does this help at all? Like, I, I does oh, any yeah, of this help? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I'll just I'm, say, I'm I sorry for putting be, you on the spot there. <laughs> no, not at all. I, I tend to be really methodical, uh, analytical yeah. in my approach to, well, everything, but practicing guitar as well. So that's why I'm, I'm always looking for like the, the right way to play, I guess. Yeah. Is. And yeah, playing free could maybe help me pull back from that a bit. Yeah. Well, I, and I totally understand where you're coming from. And, you know, that makes complete sense that you're going to, and, and you need that. You know, I think some people overemphasize, you know, just, oh, hear it and just listen and you'll learn it sort of a deal. And that's, mm-hmm. I think that needs to be supplemented with some of this more conceptual theory stuff, you know. And then there's some people that are just way too, you know, we're going to play the melodic minor over top of this chord when this chord comes up. And that's okay. But if that's all that we're focusing on, then we're missing the entire uh, point, I think, of improvisation. Okay, awesome. So is there anything else that I could help you with right now, like as far as anything we've talked about or anything else that we haven't talked about? Well, I had one other question. Um, Yeah. So in the course, we learn licks and some improv techniques like using chord tones, guide tones, enclosures, and referencing the melody. Um. I'm just wondering where can I find more of these maybe rudimentary type techniques like enclosures? You know, um, my, my first guitar teacher told me about the appoggiatura. And so I'm wondering, is, is there a, a, a resource you could suggest like books, mm. websites, or maybe, uh, I don't know, anything you could suggest yeah. for finding those types of techniques? Yeah. So, I mean, one book that I think is interesting to maybe like just spend some time in, um, uh, I think it's called Patterns for Jazz, and it might be by Jerry Coker. Let me just actually look at it really quick. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's actually it's but Jerry Coker is one of the uh, one of the uh, authors. It's just called Patterns for Jazz, and that that has a lot of just like interesting ideas in it um, that you know covers you know things like that that would be worth exploring into a little bit. Um, okay. Another resource I would suggest, and I don't suggest this because it's mine. Um, I actually don't even make any money off of this anymore, mm-hmm. <laughs> but is a book that I did for Hal Leonard called Visual Improvisation for Jazz Guitar. And that would be good for you as a guitar player okay. um, because it really uh, just, I kind of just go through like just mastering the fretboard, just knowing every single note everywhere, but in a different way though, in a way that like you're connecting chords together very uniquely. Um mm-hmm. I think that might be something that you could just, you know, spend a little bit of time in and, you know, maybe just kind of go through it and see if you can't learn some things. Um, because a lot of this stuff too, like when, you know, we've talked about these different elements of improvisation today. So some of it too is just knowing your instrument, right? You know, yeah. um, the more gray areas you're able to get out of the way and shine some light on them, the easier things get just to come up with ideas. You know what I mean? Do you ever yeah, feel that sure. way? Do you ever feel like, oh, you know, I feel like there's I, there's some unknowns on my instrument? Well, yeah. I mean, usually above the, uh, you know, above the 15th fret. <laughs> I don't play up there that yeah. often, but... Uh, yeah, and I mean, it's just a repeat of what's down lower, but I don't play up that high that often. So it feels like a bit of a gray area to me up there. Yeah. Yeah. And even sometimes, you know, playing certain, you know, like for example, like playing, 
a, a C minor chord anywhere, you know, on the neck or like, you know, if you're anywhere on the neck, what's the closest note? And then can you create, you know, an inversion of that? Like these are things right. that, you know, are all of us can work on forever. And I think that's some mm-hmm. of the stuff that I cover there. So Dan, like, let me just ask, is there, you know, I mean, I think that people are interested just to know, like, you know, from you, like, what what kind of stuff have you learned? What what have been like your successes with learning to play jazz and going through this journey? Like, what are some things that you would give advice to people that are listening right now? Um, I think that uh, there's a danger in focusing on one thing too much, mm-hmm. right? So you don't want to spend all your time for weeks on end focusing on patterns or say, you know, just transcribing a solo because you can kind of lose sight of the the bigger picture. So one of the things that I've really struggled with over the years is um, just trying to figure out what it is I should be practicing and, and having some end goal in sight and, and knowing what steps I had to take to achieve that end goal. So uh, yeah, having a practice routine that's just laid out for me has been incredibly helpful. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a huge thing because especially with the internet these days, and it's funny that I say that because that's what I that's what I do for a living is I create resources, uh, you know, online. But there's so much stuff out there, right? It just uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. To YouTube and there's yeah, you go into YouTube. There's billions of things. There's you know lessons everywhere. But I think sometimes we just need a process to really follow to really yeah, know what's a balanced sure. routine. Yeah, I, I've got a, a stack of uh, Just Jazz Guitar magazines down in the basement that I've been, you know, meaning to go through for <laughs> almost a decade now. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, there's just so much material, as you say, there's there's uh, there's podcasts, videos, books, um, all kinds of stuff out there. And just kind of putting it into the right context and finding uh, space for it in my practice routine in a way that makes sense. Uh, mm. it, it's really important that I think for everyone to find something that works for them. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much for being on. I hope that some of this helped today. I hope that, uh, you know, I hope that you can take action on some of this stuff that, uh, we talked about that. I think oh, absolutely. Great... It's been helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And I will, so, I will give it a shot for sure. Oh, awesome. Oh, thanks. Thanks for taking the time to be on the podcast too. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, it takes someone being a little vulnerable to do it. So thank you so much. And Hey, you know, maybe we'll check up with you later on on the show and just see how you're doing. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. I appreciate it. All right, that's all for today's show. I want to thank again Dan Sitch for being so open to having his coaching call on the podcast. Really appreciate him and uh, hope you learned something from his uh, lesson as well. And, you know, some of the stuff that Dan was saying at the end, you know, having that that practice routine, having that stuff lined up, a balanced practice uh, sessions with goals in mind, that's exactly what he's doing and other students are doing in my jazz practicing course, 30 Steps to Better Jazz Playing. So if you want to get involved in that you can go to 30 steps to better jazz playing.com that's three zero steps to better jazz playing.com there is a required free mini course uh, kind of like the first module of the course that you have to take before getting invited into 30 steps but that's how you get the ball rolling so go ahead sign up there and as always i ask if you got some value today's show just leave a kind rating and review on itunes or wherever you listen to podcasts just a great way to help support the show for free All right, we're going to be coming out with another episode of the podcast next week. I'll see you back then. Thanks for listening to the LJS Podcast, brought to you by LearnJazzStandards.com. Subscribe to the series on iTunes, and don't forget to join our jazz community at LearnJazzStandards.com forward slash newsletter.